Amen. Grace and peace to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Welcome to Benson Memorial United Methodist Church. So happy to see all of you gathered here in the sanctuary. If you're joining us online, we also welcome you into this time and this space with us to worship God together on this second Sunday of Pentecost. I'll call your attention to several events and uh, uh, upcoming uh, that are on the screen there that uh, you might want to be aware of. I also encourage all of you to look at the Beacon newsletter that is available, and it has uh, these events plus more, our full church calendar on there for upcoming uh, the next upcoming weeks. So uh, check that out. Uh, do note that today is the last day to return cards that you may have uh, prepared for the women's prison ministry visit team that will be going on Tuesday night there. So if you are preparing a card or want to prepare a card, uh, Pat needs those uh, today, if at all possible. You'll also uh, be in prayer for our upcoming Vacation Bible School. Continue to encourage enrollment. We have spaces left. And so if you know uh, children and families in your neighborhood or any place else, uh, please encourage them to come and enjoy Vacation Bible School with us in a few weeks. And you also see there this week, uh, later this week, annual conference of the United Methodist Church. The North Carolina Annual Conference is meeting in Greenville, and we covet your prayers. Uh, there is a number of us from Benson Memorial that will be going. I, of course, will, will have to go, and so I will be there. But uh, there are others uh, in, uh, in the congregation who are going. Ron Springsteen is our delegate representing the church. And then Susan Brooks and John Reese will be going to serve as at-large delegates for the Capital District uh, and representing uh, the district. There has to be an equal number of laypersons and clergy persons, and so we always uh, elect at-large delegates from the laity to ensure that uh, there's enough laity to keep the clergy in line. And no, uh, just because there's equal representation, but uh, we have important work to do this week, and uh, we also have joyful work. Uh, annual conference is not only a time to do business and budgets and those sorts of necessary things, but it's a time to worship. It's a time to celebrate our connection and to uh, re-engage one another. I, a lot of uh, my pastor friends I don't get to see much during the year except at annual conference, so it's a joyful time as well. But be in prayer for us. If you'd like to watch it online, it is available. Look in the beacon. You'll find the link, and you can uh, see all sessions except the executive sessions uh, online. And we would invite you to do that. And once we are back from Greenville, we will be reporting on what happened there and answering any questions that you may have. So today, on this second Sunday of Pentecost, let us move forward into worship with great joy, with great anticipation. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. 
Please stand as you are able and join me in today's greeting. The Lord is calling us into worship. We hear the call. We come come in faith. The Lord blesses us in this hour. We are are grateful. grateful. We We will bless bless others. others. Please remain standing for the opening prayer. Our God, our Father, we come today with praise in our hearts and thanksgiving on our lips. Fill us with constant joy and enliven our worship with your abiding presence. We are glad to be in the house of the Lord today. Bless us in this time as we follow the call of Christ and feel the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. Today's first reading is from Romans 4, 13 to 25. For the promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For it is the adherents of the law who are to be their, the heirs. Faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there transgression. For this reason, the promise depends on faith in order that it may rest on grace so that it may be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham. 
Abraham, who is the father of all of us, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. And Abraham, in the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Hoping against hope, he believed that he would become the father of all nations. According to what was said, so shall your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was already as good as dead, for he was about a hundred years old and the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith and he gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Therefore, it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now the words, it was reckoned to him, were written not for the sake of, for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be reckoned to us who believed in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was handed over to, for our trespasses and was grave, raised to our justification. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Amen. How wonderful. The Lord is good and the choir is too. <laughs> Any young people that I am missing can come up. Who likes to take a trip? You like to go on a trip. Where do you like to go? Are you planning a vacation? Is mom and dad planning a vacation to go? Where are you going to go? Do you know? You don't know? It's a surprise. The beach. Yeah, a lot of people love going to the beach. I talked to someone at the first service who said, I won't see you for a couple of weeks. And I said, where are you going? 
He said, I'm going on a cruise. Going on two, in fact, which kind of made me jealous because, I, you know, cruises are nice. But we all like to take trips. My mother used to tell me, we're going on vacation, and I would get so excited. I said, Mom, where are we going? She said, we're going to annual conference. <laughs> That's my life. <laughs> yes, yeah, right. So, but we went other places, too. But we like taking a trip, and we have to decide kind of where we want to go. And we base that on who we are, what we like to do. Do you like Disney World? Yeah, oh, yeah. That's a foolish question to even ask. But see, I don't really like Disney World. Nothing wrong with Disney World. My children have been. I've never been. I've never been. My father always promised to take me, and he never did. And so I've just, I, I've just said I'm not going. But you know what I like to do? I don't like amusement parks, but when I was a kid, I'd like to go to Civil War battlefields. Yeah, it was, kind of, it was kind of strange. I used to make my sister cry. She'd sit in the car because I spent so much time climbing over the monuments and looking and getting the details that she just couldn't stand it. Okay, well, you and I can go to a Civil War battlefield. Point is, we get invited on trips, and sometimes we enjoy where we're going, sometimes we don't enjoy. But the trip we're going to hear about today is one God calls a man named Abram. And it's a difficult trip. And God shows him why he's going on. So when we think about going on trips, let's celebrate. Because God goes with us wherever we go, whether it's the beach or Disney World or Gettysburg or annual conference. <laughs> That'll be my vacation this year. <laughs> and it's quite exciting, just let me tell you all. It's quite exciting. <laughs> Greenville. So I get to go home and I get ice cream one night. That's it. That's it. It's a win for me. Uh, so, uh, but let's celebrate that God calls us. Okay, let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for calling us and we thank you for going with us on our vacations and trips and wherever you tell us to go, you are with us. We thank you. We love you, God. Amen. All right, enjoy the beach. Well, our worship today continues with a reading again from Genesis. As I mentioned last week, uh, this summer, June and July and August, I'll be preaching through the book of Genesis. But as you might be able to tell from the citation in the bulletin uh, or that you've seen, we are not going to preach or study uninterrupted through Genesis. Last week we were in Genesis chapter 1. This week we moved all the way to Genesis chapter 2. Well, and such is the flow and the gift of the Revised Common Lectionary. In three years, if you follow that, you get through the majority of the Bible, but not every aspect or every verse of the Bible. There are many things left out of the Revised Common Lectionary. And so as we go through Genesis this summer, I would encourage you to read this beautiful chapter on your own to cover the parts, to study the parts that we will not be engaging in worship, and to see what God is saying to you through this wonderful and holy book of Scripture. So today we go to chapter 12, with beginning in verse 1. Hear now this living word of God for us, God's living people. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Abram took his wife Sarah and his brother's son Lot and all the possessions they had gathered and the persons whom they had acquired in Haran. 
And they set forth to go to the land of Canaan. And when they had come to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place at Shechem, to the oak of Moreh. At the time, the Canaanites, Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he moved on to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and I on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and invoked the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on by stages toward the Negev. This is the word of God given to us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. I invite you to pray with me. Holy Lord, as we venture deeper into your holy word in the book of Genesis, be our companion and reveal your truth through its pages. Reveal yourself to us as we are on a journey on a journey with each other, on a journey to draw close to you. Lord, as your word is proclaimed in this moment, walk among us and touch us. Be glorified in everything that is said. Correct my errors. Bring about beauty from my brokenness. Lord, be with us now and speak. Your servants are gathered. We are listening. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Well, many of you know this, but crossing a border is not easy, even if you cross it because you want to. I remember an especially wonderful but trying day when I started the morning off in Jordan, the country of Jordan. But I had to cross over to Israel briefly before we went on into Egypt. And at one point, I remember I had to empty the entire contents of my suitcase so a border agent could check for what I don't know, but he was checking for very carefully all the same. And at another point, a different border agent took my passport and disappeared with it for a long time before he came back and returned. One person in our group had traveled earlier to Lebanon and that country's stamp on his passport earned him an hour-long private conversation with the Israelis. And what's more, all three of these borders had to be crossed on foot. So as we exited Jordan, we pulled out our bag, we pulled our baggage across several hundred empty yards before we were welcomed there in Israel. And we rode a bus over to the border of Egypt. But again, we had to walk across, go through all the same checks we had just done, and then board a different bus waiting for us on the other side as we journeyed down into the Sinai wilderness. A few days later, the same process had to be followed as we crossed back into Israel for our stay in that now, believe me, it may sound like it, but this is not a woe-is-me story. The month I spent traveling through those countries and others was a wonderful experience. And I would guess that as an American, I had much less hassle trekking across these sometimes very tense borders than others do, especially the Palestinians who live in the West Bank but who work in Israel who are forced to spend as much as three hours or more every day crossing the border close to the town of Bethlehem. But still, for most of us who have lived our lives in the United States and have casually crossed state lines hundreds of times, having to walk across a border while being vigorously searched and questioned about why we were there and where we were headed, that is not our everyday, usual experience. Now, I knew exactly why I was crossing those borders, and you had to say exactly why you were going. But why was Abram crossing the border there at Hazard, which is in today's Turkey? Why was he going into Canaan? Could he have answered that question? 
Why, in fact, had Abram's father earlier uprooted his entire family, including Abram, and disputed and disrupted their lives in Ur, way over in what is now Iraq, right below Baghdad, just to reach our offer? To put it simply, God called them to go. Although the journey was hard and the future was uncertain, both Terah, Abram's father, and Abram go where they go. They do what they do because they are convinced that they are faithfully responding to God's invitation by going. They may not know everything that will happen along the, the journey, that they are walking. They might not fully see what will happen and what will await them when that journey ends, but at least it seems that they know why they are going. God is calling them. And so they go. And, you know, we can maybe relate to that. Everyone here, everyone hearing my voice today has gone someplace that perhaps they did not want to go to. But the going was made at least a little more simple. It was made a bit easier if you knew why you had to go. It is common to be change adverse. Most of us are. But one of the most important change management strategies is making sure people know why things are changing, why it is changing. Knowing why may not make everything suddenly okay, but knowing why, at least, is like a spoonful of sugar helping the medicine go down. So Terah, again, Abram's father, at the end of Genesis chapter 11, right before we, what we read today started, and Abram at the beginning of Genesis 12, which you just heard, the beginning of, seem to know why they go. God calls, but I wonder what about everybody else in that household. Abram doesn't make the trip into Canaan with his nephew uh, alone, but he goes with his nephew Lot and his wife Sarah and all of the servants that they had acquired along the way and with the family's animals and all of the possessions. It must have been quite, quite a caravan. Dr. Carol Hessel wondered in an article that she wrote about this text whether or not Everyone around Abram felt uh, as strongly about leaving Haran as in going into Canaan. What did they think about it? Did they also want to go? Presumably, Sarah wanted to stay with her husband, but did anyone else involved really have a true say in the matter, in the decision? Did their feelings make any difference to Abram if they didn't want to go? Did it make any difference to God? When I first embarked on the journey toward ordained ministry, the boards evaluating me asked over and over, how does your family feel about this church? You say you are willing to itinerate. You're willing to go anywhere that we send and God calls. But what about them? Are they willing? You won't move on your own. What seems like a good idea to move for one may not be the best for everyone else. And when it comes to Abram, we often have this romantic notion of a great man responding unquestioningly in faith to a mighty God. But let me tell you something you probably already know. Life is rarely so neat. Abram's decision to follow is one that he makes for himself, he, but he also makes it for many others. We may forget the difficulty of Abram's decision along with the struggles that he encounters on the way because we already know this full story. You know, sometimes when we read the Bible, faith is made to sound and seem much easier than it is in practice. These fantastic promises made by God do not seem so far-fetched to us because we have seen how they are fulfilled, how they are still being fulfilled. The whole set of circumstances is made a bit sterile from simply reading about it on a page in the Bible in the safety and the comfort of our own situation. 
Yet let's not miss this fact. The choice to pack up and move across these borders could not have been an easy one. This is certainly no vacation, but a journey filled with uncertainty and even great danger. And on top of that, more practical concerns, immediate concerns emerge. Moving is never an easy thing. I don't have to tell you that. Any, everybody here has moved at least once. Where's Pat? She just did. She, can t she could preach this part because she has lived it. She, but it's never an easy thing. First of all, it's logistically tough. What gets packed first? What gets left behind? Who's going to load and unload all this stuff? And also, moving comes with an emotional cost. The places we, are, we live are filled with memories of love and laughter. They become a part of us and we a part of them. The places where we make these mountains of memories are difficult to leave behind. And when we arrive at the place where we are going, we move into that new home, we reach a new town, we take a new job, well, it takes time to settle in there. We are apt to feel like strangers for a long time in a brand new place. Yes, sometimes we must move. But doing so always costs something. Always costs us something. Now, some costs are simply higher than others. And it makes me wonder if the narratives about immigration in our current day ought to be questioned a bit more than they sometimes are. Many argue that immigrants are eager to pick up and leave home for various reasons, to get benefits, to take jobs, to get this, that, or the other thing. But I wonder if immigrants are just so eager as we might first imagine. Perhaps most immigrants are more desperate than eager. When Joan and I were in El Salvador a few years ago, we worked with a church providing after-school care for children who were otherwise being targeted by the gangs there to run drugs or commit petty theft. Offers that if they were resisted would certainly cause violence and harm to their families, maybe even to the kids themselves. Kids were disappearing all the time. And I can imagine most of the El Salvadorians, those that I met there, that I talked with, they were not eager to leave the place from where they had been born, but instead they felt they had no choice but to do so. The experience in El Salvador helped me to understand immigration is not an issue to be solved, but it is a mission in which we are to take part. It is a mission. It involves the real lives of real people. And part of that mission is to see borders in a different way. The challenges of immigrants are beyond what most of us will ever experience. Um, Alejandria Olivia recently wrote in the Christian Century magazine. She wrote an article titled, The Borders Are Everywhere. And Olivia shares that the borders between nations are not the only borders faced by immigrants. The so-called immigration system is simply filled with them. The geographic boundaries are only the start. Courthouses and hearing rooms and detention centers and tenuous living conditions in crowded apartments. Spaces in which no one speaks a word that you can understand. Countless everyday decisions about where it is safe to go or who can be trusted. The borders go on and on and on as far as our eyes can see and beyond. Olivia writes, the border is everywhere, and everywhere it exists, it makes people's lives harder. It makes people's lives harder. Now, I'm not standing here arguing that borders are not necessary. I'm not saying that at all. But consider, what if borders, became not obstacles to be overcome, 
but opportunities to be honest. What if instead of making people's lives harder, borders became places of fresh possibility? What if we imagined what borders looked like? We reimagined them and how we used them. In 2004, a movie was released titled The Day After Tomorrow. Many of you may have seen it. It's shown over and over. It's rebroadcast. In fact, I watched half of it yesterday, even though I've seen it numerous times. And the premise of that movie is that long-term changes in the ocean currents and other climate-related shifts result in a sudden new ice age across much of the northern hemisphere. And so adventure uh, uh, comes from in the movie, but there's a thought-provoking scene there where the Rio Grande River is suddenly being crossed by thousands of persons from Canada and the United States, moving toward the safety of the warmer temperatures in the South. In this movie, at least, the border becomes a place of rescue, where second chances are found and new homes located. Borders may indeed be everywhere. They even may be necessary, yes, but how they are used and what they mean to us, well, that's up to us. We have a choice. Abram stands on a border. He's invited to cross from what is known into what is unknown, from what is expected to what disrupts, from what is comfortable to what will be laborious at times. And yet God also calls with a blessing and a promise to make Abram's name great. God's promises and God can be trusted. God will bring great nations into existence through these promises. God will bless Abram so he will be a blessing to others. And so Abram was allowed to walk across that land to have a foretaste of God's faithfulness from Shechem to the Oak of Moray, to the land between Bethel and Ai. Abram walked it not to see the difficulties ahead, but to anticipate the blessing that was coming. Not to worry about the future struggles, but to rejoice in God's generosity. Not to think of himself, but to celebrate those generations that would rise in this place long after Abram and Sarai returned to the dust. The past was behind Abram. The future was ahead. A border became an invitation. The gate through which a divine promise would be fulfilled. Abram faithfully stepped forward with Sarai and all the others into a shared future. My friends, again, borders are everywhere. We don't view them. We don't use them as wisely as does God. In our fragile and flawed hands, we often use them to make lives more difficult, even our own lives more difficult, rather than gateways to a promise. We turn borders into places of fear, violence, and inhospitality. For us, a border becomes an occasion to turn back rather than moving ahead. But in the hands of God, borders become something quite different. In fact, they become something absolutely remarkable. God transforms borders into places to be called forward. God makes the border a place of promise of a flourishing future, not just for a few, but for all of God's children. Now, likely none of us will ever choose, let alone be forced to become an immigrant, yet that Privilege should not be lorded over those who are. Borders are not meant to make life harder for the most vulnerable, but instead borders are places where lives become infused with fresh promises. You see, church, that is what God is doing when inviting us to cross borders. We go from what was to what can be. We are no longer wandering individuals doing what we choose, but nations blessed by God with a holy purpose. 
And just because we may never become an immigrant, physically moving across geographical lines, we are still called to move. God's call may not lend us a change in geography, may not force us to face fences and guards, but instead we may be invited to cross the most difficult border of all, the one in our mind, the sort that shapes our imagination, the one that determines if a border will be used to include or exclude, welcome or turn away to make life more difficult or to place or a place to love others as God loves us. The border can be right outside the church. Before Abram could cross the border from Haran to Canaan, God had to shape his mind to give him God's vision to see hope so that he could dream. And so Abram stood at that border. He heard the call of God to cross it. He listened and moved forward. And he was blessed so abundantly that those blessings resound with a mighty relevance even to this day. What about us? Do we hear God's call? Will we also listen? Are we? ready to cross. Glory to God. Amen. Now I invite you to stand as we affirm our faith. Today our affirmation will be a statement of faith of the Korean Methodist Church found in your hymnals on page 884. 884. A statement of faith of the Korean Methodist Church. We believe in the one God, creator and sustainer of all things, father of all nations, the source of all goodness, all truth and love. We believe in Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh, our teacher, example, and redeemer, the savior of the world. We believe in the Holy Spirit, God present with us for guidance, for comfort, and for strength, we believe in the forgiveness of sins, in the life of love and prayer, and in grace equal to every need. We believe in the Word of God contained in the Old and New Testaments as the sufficient rule both of faith and of practice. We believe in the church, those who are united in the living Lord for the purpose of worship and service. We believe in the reign of God as the divine will realized in human society and in the family of God, where we are all brothers and sisters. We believe in the final triumph of righteousness and in the life everlasting. Amen. <laughs> One of the joys of worship is being able to pray together, and so I invite you to adopt an attitude and posture of prayer. Let us go to the Lord. Gracious and holy Lord, you have called us into this space of worship and praise to give you glory and to celebrate the goodness of your generosity. 
We ask that your Spirit move among us and give us hope, a hope for the future that enlivens our hearts and makes us glad that we follow Christ's call in it. Refresh and revive each of us. Give us ears to hear and eyes to see and spirits to obey your will as we go where we are sent to do acts of mercy and kindness so that Christ steadily increases as we decrease. Bless us in this tender moment, and yes, hear our prayer. God, embrace the gathering of the North Carolina Annual Conference this week, and draw United Methodists together for your glory in the mission and ministry that you give. May each of us have the mind of Christ in our debate and discussion, so that even when disagreements are sharp and direction is unclear, We will have hearts filled with love and compassion that unite us in our diversity in the name of Jesus. For our leaders and all the delegates, give the the gift of gentle and holy wisdom. Fill the gathering with joy. In everything done, in everything suggested, in every thought we have, may you, Lord of all, be glorified. May your kingdom grow. May your love increase among us. We gather with anticipation, trusting in you to be our guiding star, our holy influence, our rock when the storms come, the sun of a new day when turbulence passes. Lord, hear our prayer for those who are sick and ailing, for those for whom the days ahead are filled with uncertainty and fear, those who are lonely, those who are neglected, those who are forgotten. Lord, now hear the groans of our hearts, the prayers that we offer to you in just a moment of silence where we unburden our hearts because we trust in you. Lord, hear our prayer, and may your will be done. We pray all things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, whose precious blood redeems us and gives us endurance in the things that are and hope in the things that will be, as we together share the prayer he taught his disciples and gives to us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we have prayed together, we worship together. And we worship in a spirit in a spirit of unity in which we can be assured that Christ is here. And so I invite you to stand as you're able and greet those around you. For those of you online, we invite you also to share the peace of Christ. Please stand and greet your neighbor with this sign, the peace of Christ be with you. You may be seated. As we have heard, God is always calling us to move forward. And we can move forward with the assurance that we will be provided for. Because God is generous. God is always merciful. God is calling us not to stand alone, but to stand with God. Into the promises God makes. 
And so in this time of offering, we invite you to glorify God in your giving and also to support the mission and ministry of God's church. Now is the time to trust God, to celebrate His goodness, and to celebrate God's holy church. Give as the ushers come by. Many of you give online. We acknowledge that and appreciate it. Give whatever you give, however you give it, for the glory of God. Lord, we stand before you with hearts filled with gratitude, grateful that you give us the ability to give. And we ask, Lord, that you give to us yet again. Give us the gift of wisdom and discernment to use these gifts for your glory. To use these gifts to proclaim the good news, to release the captive from captivity, to heal the sick, and to usher in the year of the Lord's faith when you, Lord, will be acknowledged as God, and every knee shall bow and every tongue confess your Son, Jesus Christ, as Lord. It is in his name we pray. Amen. I invite us all to remain standing as we sing our closing hymn, number 374, Standing on the Promises. And and know as you sing this, let it be a prayer. Let it be an acknowledgement that God does make promises. And let it be a celebration 
that God keeps promises. Let us sing with joy. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God my Savior, Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises that cannot fail, when howling storms of doubt and fear assail, by the living word of God I shall prevail. Standing on the promises of God, Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises of Christ, my Lord. Bound to him eternally by love's strong cord, listening and hearing to his sword, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing. Standing on the promises of God Standing on the promises I cannot fall Listening every moment to the Spirit's call Resting in my Savior through my all and all Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. Indeed, we are standing on the promises of God, and that gives us great assurance and hope. So as you go into the world from this place, let God lead you. Bear the light of Christ. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Go in peace, all of you. Amen. All right. Good job. Still holding down everything out here? There you go. Hey, there's more than one way to do it. How you doing? Okay. All right. They'll take care of that. <laughs>